and he'd, he'd fall, even though he was holding on to my fingers. And he would do that a couple times until I had the bright idea that I should probably hold on to his hand instead of him holding on to my hand. So as I held on to his hand, he never fell again. He never tripped again. Even though he tripped, he never fell to, to the ground. And I think this is a, a beautiful illustration of how we should walk with God. Rather than us trying to hold on to God, let God hold on to us. Right? And as he holds on to us, we, we may stumble, but we won't fall because he's, he's holding us. Right? Uh, if you would, turn to John chapter 10, page 81 in your pew Bible. And by the way, for the next six weeks, the next six weeks, we're going to be studying uh, uh, the 23rd Psalm. So that's what we're going over the next six weeks. So we're just looking at a little piece of it tonight. So plan on it for the next six weeks as we're just going to be going through verse by verse the 23rd Psalm. And I think you're going to be pleased how this Psalm just uh, unfolds, how much we can get out of it. You know, we could probably go longer than six weeks if we had to, you know. So why are you starting in John chapter 10 then? Well, because I'm leading up to it, okay? John chapter 10, 81. Okay, all right. Well, the evening crowds get sort of rowdy, sort of unruly. Okay, I'm just <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, all right. I think it's a nap in the afternoon. They get, they, yeah, that's right. It says, John 10, verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal, only to kill and destroy. I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Verse 14, Jesus again says what? I am the good shepherd. Let me ask you this. If there's a good shepherd, then conversely, there must be a, a bad shepherd, right? Verse 14, I am a good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So if you're a Christian, you're in God's hands. Rather than you trying to hold on to God, let God hold on to you. And he says, no one can snatch you out of my hands. Our salvation is based upon God's ability to hold on to us, not our ability to hold on to God. So we can have confidence and, and assurance knowing that, that we're in God's hands. Well, the 23rd Psalm is, is a beautiful reflection of the understanding and confidence that we can have in God. So I want to just give you a background of the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm is a psalm of, uh, that David wrote, and the context of it was when he was on the run from his, uh, uh, his son Absalom, was trying to kill him. So he was on the run, and you know we, th we think our kids disappoint us. Huh? <laughs> so his son Absalom is trying to kill him. Uh, he's fleeing for his life, and he's out in the wilderness. And the psalm was written by David under a time of deep duress, and deep trouble. It was one of the most difficult periods in his life, but David expressed confidence in God, and he calls God his shepherd, right? That God would deliver him, God would hold him, God would, would uh, uh, not let him fall. So through the years, this psalm has brought me comfort, and it's always read at funerals and, and whatnot, because it's a reminder of the confidence and, that we can have in, in God. Uh, So let's look at verse 1 of the 23rd Psalm, if you would. I don't have a page number. 401? 401. 401. So if you would, look at page 401. Verse 1 of the 23rd Psalm. You see it? All right. So now you understand the context. David's on the run. He's in a dire situation. I mean, he didn't write this psalm from a, a top of a mountaintop, a beautiful sunset, a life of ease, thinking, oh, life is so good. He wrote this in a terrible time in his life when he was on the run. His own son was trying to kill him. A time of great distress and duress. But how does he start it off? He writes it off with, by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. 
And the word Lord in Hebrew here is, is Yahweh. And Yahweh is the personal name of God. It's the same word Lord that is used in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. If you want to turn there, page 42 in your pew Bible. And also I gave you a list of names. Uh, let me just borrow this here. I gave you this here. Just keep this in your Bible. This is just for you, for your reference. Uh, just the different names of God. Exodus uh, chapter 3, verse 15. Page 42 in your pew Bible. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord. And this is the same word that, that David is using in Psalm 23. The Lord. Meaning Yahweh. That's the term there. Yahweh. Okay. Say, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name. So here's the Lord's name. He's telling him right here. This is my name. It's the Lord. It's Yahweh, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Now, this name was a dear name, but it was also very revered and respected. In fact, the Jews wouldn't even mention this name. Uh, uh, they would even omit some of the, the letters or the vowels, as you can see in here. So what they did is they combined two words, and they made a word. They combined Yahweh. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Yahweh. They took the consonants out of Yahweh, and you see it on the bottom down there, Y-H-W-H, right? And they got the vowels out of Adonai, and they combined Adonai and Yahweh, the vowels from Adonai, and put it together with Yahweh, and they came up with a word. Anybody want to guess what it is? Jehovah. That's how they got the term Jehovah, by taking the vowels out of, uh, the, uh, the vowels out of Adonai and the consonants out of Yahweh and combining it together. So that way they could speak God's name because it was just so revered and, and so respected. Okay? So here. So that's the term that David uses. Uh, how he identifies the Lord. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd, right? He had confidence in, in Yahweh. So I want to look at it, if you have your handouts here. Does everyone have a handout this morning or this evening? I want to remember three things about the awesome God who wants us to be his, about Yahweh who holds us in his hand. And first is his character. The first thing I want to look about God is his character. And if you read Exodus 34, page 67 in your pew Bible. Exodus 34, page 67 in your pew Bible, starting in verse 6. Uh huh, awesome. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate, gracious God. Now he talks about his character here, slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. So the one who holds us in his hand, he is patient, he's gracious, he's faithful, he's abounding in love, he's forgiving, he's just. That's the God that we serve. And he's ready to forgive our sins when we call on him. God is also eternal. He's eternal. He has no beginning and no end. This is what you hear from your kids sometimes. Well, who made God? Nobody made God. That's a hard concept to understand. God always existed. Nobody made God. God has life in himself. God is a necessary... Uh, well, look at John chapter 5. And I hope I can find it. Yeah. John 5, 26. John 5, 26. I don't have a page number, so if you find it in your pew Bible, just holler it out. 75. Page 75. So who gave God life? Who created God? Nobody. John chapter 5, verse 26 says, For as the Father has life in himself... 
Nobody gave God life. He has life in himself. So he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Now, what in our world can exist independent from anything else? Everything in our world is dependent upon something else for its existence. Plants need what? The sun for photosynthesis, right? We need oxygen. We need water. Uh, yeah, we need food. Animals need food. Everything in our planet or on, on, our, on our planet Earth here is dependent upon something for its existence. We don't have life in ourselves, do we? Now, what about the planet Earth? Can the planet Earth exist autonomously? No. What do we need for existence? The sun and the moon, right? So where does it stop? Where does it stop? Because if you keep going up the chain, everything is dependent upon something else for its existence, right? God is at the top. It has to stop at God. Because everything else is dependent upon something else for its existence. And God has life in himself. He doesn't need anything else for his existence. Nobody created God. God always was. He always is. So God is eternal. And God is holy. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had a revelation of God. And he described God as holy, holy, holy. Now, when they showed a different degree of something, a superlative, like uh, good, better, and best, we don't, they didn't have that in, in uh, Hebrew. They would have to repeat a word to show this is stronger, stronger. So they would repeat it to show the difference. But to repeat a word three times was unheard of in the Hebrew language. But when they were talking of God and his holiness to show that nothing compared to his holiness, the word holy was repeated three times. And you won't find that anywhere else in Hebrew, except when they're talking about God and his holiness. God is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. What does it mean to be holy? What is that? Set apart, without sin, right? Without sin. God is unchanging. We may get older. We may get weaker as we get older. We, you know, but God never gets older. God never gets weaker. God never gets tired. That's good, too, because I would hate to think of God getting older and ill-tempered and cranky, <laughs> right? But God doesn't change. God is unchanging. He is the same today as he was yesterday, as he will be tomorrow, as he will be forever. God is unchanging. God is truthful. Hebrews 6.18 tells us the one thing God cannot do. What is it? He can't lie. God cannot lie. So we can take comfort of knowing this is the God who has us in his hand this is the God that's holding on to us let's look at the second thing we need to remember about our awesome shepherd God is the creator of all things God is the creator of all things look at Isaiah chapter 40 Isaiah chapter 40 This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because I, I really believe this really... Remember the analogy I gave you with bringing God close? And when we bring God close, our problems pale in comparison. What usually happens to us is we have our problems closer than God, so our problems seem bigger than God. This, every time I read this chapter, it brings God closer to me. Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 12. Are you with me? Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counsel? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in in a bucket. Think of uh, uh, the great nation of China, the many people, all the people in our nation, all the great armies that they have in this world. And the Lord says, they're like a drop in a bucket to me. 
They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before, all, for, b- before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? Verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. Just a a side note, I think that's interesting. How did they know the the earth was round? Yeah. How did they know the earth was round? Yeah. Well, back then they thought it was square, remember? They thought it was flat. But here in God's scripture, it says, no, the earth, the circle of the earth. There's just, to me, it's just further evidence this is God's divine inspired word, right? When God is revealing himself, God didn't refer to the flat earth as they thought it was back then. He referred to it as the circle of the earth. And his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Uh, verse 26. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary, grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. But those, verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Have any of you ever heard of uh, um, How Great Is Our God by Louis Giglio? If you get a chance, go on YouTube and just Google that. How Great Is Our God by Louis Giglio. Don't ask me how to spell Giglio. But it's, it's a, uh, one of the most fascinating, fascinating videos I have ever seen. Because what he does is, at first he starts with the stars. How God is the star breather. How he just created these stars. And it's, it's incredible how he expounds on this. And then he takes, all, it takes it all the way down from the stars down to the human body. Down to, to how our, our cells are put together. And there's a protein that holds the cells together. And the protein is called laminin. Have, you, have any of you heard this? And laminin is in the shape of a cross. It's a protein. And then he compares it to Colossians chapter 1, where it says where Jesus Christ holds everything together. He created all things, and he holds all things together. Just a, a powerful video. If you get a chance, watch it. How Great Is Our God by, by Louis Giglio. But right now, I'd like for us to sing How Great Is Our God, hymn number 10. Well, what is it? It was 10. How, yeah, how great thou art, yeah. I don't know what, what hymn, but maybe stanza one and three, if we could sing it. Huh? There is? Oh, I don't know that. 147, yeah. Louis. Louis Giglio, how great is our God? And there, there might be like five minute segments on YouTube. Try to, try to get the one that's like 40 something minutes because that's the whole video. Um, it's a powerful video. I've watched it numerous times and I could watch it again and not be bored. 147, first and uh, third stanza. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout 
the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Third stanza. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou I think we need to pray right now. Father, Lord, I thank you, Father, for the awesome God that we serve. Father, you are great. You are mighty. You are Yahweh, Elohim. You are Adonai. You are the creator. You are the healer. Father, I thank you, Father, for the awesome God that we serve, that you invite us to, to enter your throne room of grace, to, to find comfort in our time of need, to find compassion and mercy in our time of need, to find love in our time of need. Father, it boggles my mind that, that you are even mindful of us, that you, you are so great and mighty, but yet you are concerned about us, that your word says you even know the number of hairs on our head. That you, you, that's how concerned and intimate you are involved in our lives. Father, I don't understand it. I don't understand how you could love us so much. I am just grateful that you do. I'm grateful that we can call you the good shepherd, Father, who watches over us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And he truly is the good shepherd. How does that make you feel, knowing we have such a, a beautiful shepherd, an awesome shepherd watching over us? He's holding on to you. He's watching over you. He's caring for you. Can you take comfort in that, knowing that you are his, that he's got you in his hand, and he cares for you? Now, that's a, a, a staggering fact, that the creator of the heavens and the earth sent his son to die on the cross for you, to reconcile you back to him. There once was a, a shepherd who didn't take care of his sheep too well. And his sheep were infected with, with parasites and they were weak. And they, they grazed on dry ground, brown grass. And on the other hand, the neighbor took care of his sheep. And his sheep were fat and healthy and they grazed on the lush green grass. And the bad owner's sheep would always come to the neighbor's fence and just stick their snouts through and just longing to be on the other side of the fence, to, to, to be under that shepherd's care and I'm sure if they they could speak and they, they would say oh to be free of this terrible owner that we have you know sadly I, I believe this is a picture all over the world of those who don't belong to the good shepherd they're under the thief's care who came to steal kill and destroy and abuse them they suffer under sin and and Satan these people don't know the power of the cross they don't know Christ yet or maybe they just refuse to, to give up their freedom to come to know Christ. Sadly, some people say, well, Christ is my shepherd. But then they continue to live on the wrong side of the fence. You know, you can't have it both ways. If, if the Lord is your shepherd, then you have to remain under his, his care. Jesus said in Matthew twelve thirty, he who is not with me is against me. Number three. Third thing to remember is he cares for you. 
which leads us to the second half of verse uh, 1 of the Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. And the second half is what? I shall not be in want. When the Lord's your shepherd, you're not in want for anything. Now, wait a minute. How's, where's David writing this? Is he writing this from his palace, from his castle, wherever, where he's just being fed grapes and he's being fanned? Where is he writing this? He's on the run. His son's trying to kill him. He's in a bad situation. But yet he could say, you know what? I have everything I need. I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. I shall not be in want. You see, whatever the Lord chooses to bless me with, I'm happy with. Paul says, I've learned the secret to be content, whether with a lot of stuff or a little stuff, right? He was content. His happiness was not based on circumstances. His happiness was based on his relationship with the Lord. And I, I just always think of Job. Remember Job? Job said, Though even the Lord slay me, I will trust in him. Right? Now, what if the Lord took away everything that you have today? Would he still be Lord? Would he still love you? Would you still love him? Would your trust level change? Is your faith based on what he can give you? You see, David came to the realization because David had nothing. He was on the run. But yet he came to trust in the Lord so much, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. I know he's going to provide all that I, I need. I know that he's going to take care of me. Even out here while I'm hiding in the caves, he's going to take care of me. A little girl came home from Sunday school all excited, and she told her mommy, 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 I memorized the 23rd Psalm. And her mother said, Great, let me, let me hear you. And a little girl began to recite it. She says, the Lord is my shepherd. I got all I want. That's a good, good translation, I think, right? <clears throat> you know, we, we often forget that God provides uh, for all of our needs. A boy was bringing home a loaf of bread, and someone asked him, well, what do you got there? And the boy said, I got a loaf of bread. And someone said, well, where'd you get it? And the boy said, I got it from a baker. And he said, well, where'd the baker get it? And the boy said, well, he made it. And someone said, well, what did he make it from? And the boy said, well, from flour. And someone said, well, where did he get the flour? And the boy said, well, from the miller. Someone said, well, where did the miller get it? And the boy said, well, from the farmer. Someone said, well, where did the farmer get it? And the boy said, from God. So someone said, to him, where did you get your bread? And the boy said, from God. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all that we have is from God. He's the provider. He provides for all of our needs. If you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, every promise God could give you is yes in Jesus Christ. He's the, he's the provider. Does that mean you'll never experience hardship or, or physical poverty? No, I don't think that's what David meant when he said you shall not be in want. You're going to have all that you need. You may not have all that you want, right? You know, there's a, a false teaching in the, in the church today. And I'm sure you, you've heard a lot about it on TV. You hear these preachers all the time that if you're, prospering, if you're prospering materially, then it's a sign of God's blessings upon your life. Right? That's a teaching that is prevalent. If you're prospering, that must be a sign of God's blessings upon your life. I'm here, that's a teaching straight from hell. That is not a teaching from, from God's word. And well, how do you think that makes people feel who, who try to be faithful to God, but yet they can't rise out of the poverty level? How do you think that makes them feel? They're, they must think there's something wrong with my faith. And that's what they're told too. You know what? You just don't have enough faith. You just got to believe and God, God will bless you. Better yet, send me some money and God will bless you. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus told the rich man, One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. So is Jesus saying here we can't be wealthy? There's nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. I like uh, um, David, David Ramsey. Anyone ever take uh, uh, financial freedom with David Ramsey? Yeah, I love what he says in there. He gives the analogy of a brick. 
And he says, this brick is, is uh, uh, um, amoral. It's neither good nor bad, but it's what I do with the brick. I could take this brick and build a hospital with it. Or I could take this brick and throw it through somebody's window. So the brick in itself is amoral. It's not, not good or bad. It's what I do with it. And he said, money is like that. Money is not evil. It's what I do with it that can be either good or evil. And God's word says the love of money is the root of all evil. So you can be wealthy and enter the kingdom of, of God. Jesus is not espousing that. Everyone has to give up everything. But he, he went to this point with this young man because he knew that's where his heart was. That's the reason he zeroed in on, on money. And another lie is that, of course, when you become a Christian, you'll have a trouble-free life. Right? Yeah. First Peter chapter two, verse twenty five, it says, For you were like sheep going astray. You know, as we go through the twenty third Psalm here, over and over in the Bible, God's people were referred to as sheep. And what you're going to realize, that's not a compliment. <laughs> sheep are the dumbest animals that you were going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to realize. But you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Matthew 9, 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, and they were harassed. They were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion looking for some sheep to devour. How many of you ever watch uh, uh, Wild Kingdom? Do they still have that on TV? Remember? Animal Planet or something like that. And, and how do the lion, that when they go after maybe the, the, the buffalo or whatever, is they first have to, to separate the animal from the herd. Then they can go in for the kill. And God does that to, to the church as well. I see it happening all the time. I see people who are really active in church, and then they start coming to church. They stop coming to church. And, and you know, people are like cars. They, they, they start missing before they quit, right? But once they quit, God has effectively, I mean, Satan has effectively what? Separated you from the herd. Now he's going to come in for the kill. He's going to come and attack you because you're out of the, the, the cover of the church. You're out of the cover of the spiritual leadership of the church. He's got you uh, uh, off on the side somewhere. He separated you from the herd. I can't stress enough for you to be under the cover of the spiritual leaders in the church. In a church. It's God's design. I remember I called a lady one time in Connecticut and I asked her where she was. She says, it's none of your business. And I said, yeah, it's all, it is my business. I said, I'm your pastor. And I said, the Lord is going to hold me accountable for you because he's entrusted you under my care. You know who I'm talking about, too. Yeah. You see, I, I'm responsible for the sheep that the Lord... So if I call you, don't tell me it's none of my business. And also, if I'm calling you, don't give me a bunch of excuses. I don't want to hear excuses. You know what? I'm calling you because I love you and I care for you. That's it. I don't want to hear, well, I missed your opinion. I don't care. I'm calling, how are you? I want to make sure you're okay. I want to make sure you're okay. I'm not, yeah, uh, that's, that's, you don't have to give me a bunch of excuses why you haven't been in church. I love you. I care for you. The Lord has put you under my care. It's my job as a, as a under shepherd to help shepherd the sheep. Because you know what? He's going to hold me accountable. I think it is, Hebrews 13, 17, if I'm not mistaken. And I think I am. Oh, no, it is. Okay. What's the only book in the Bible where it says the man has to make the coffee? Okay. Hebrews 13, 17. Do you see it? It says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would not be of no advantage to you. You know what? I take my job as pastor very serious because I have a boss who's going to hold me accountable. Now, that doesn't mean that if I stray from the word of God, you've got to continue following me. But if I'm, if I'm a man of God, if I'm preaching God's word, then why shouldn't you follow me? Right? Why shouldn't you? 
And God's going to hold me accountable because it says it right here. Obey your leaders, submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. I'm going to have to stand before God one day and give an account of all the sheep that he placed under my care. You say, what happened to Joe? What happened to Mary? Why didn't you go searching for my sheep? Why didn't you take care of them? So when I call you, don't tell me it's none of my business. Okay? It is. All right? And under the same token, I have deacons. And their job is to help me. I can't, you know, I can't call everybody, can I? So the deacon's role is to help me to minister to the body of, of, of Christ as well. Okay? Uh, in Luke 19.10, Jesus said why he came. He says, I, I came to seek and save the lost sheep. Let me ask you this. Who are the lost sheep, first of all? The unsaved. Um, Why does this church exist here? Seek the lost, right? Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Okay? So we exist to seek and save the lost. That's why we're here. As I said this morning, there's one thing, I think I said it this morning, there's only one thing you can't do in heaven, and that's evangelize. I mean, uh, everything we can else do here in church, we can worship and fellowship, we'll do all that stuff in heaven. But we can't evangelize in heaven. God has you here for a purpose. If, If your whole purpose in life was just to be saved, then God would have snatched you up back to heaven. It's the moment you were saved. But obviously, he's got something that he wants you to do. What is our good shepherd concerned about? His sheep. Not only his sheep, but the sheep that have gone astray. You remember, he left the 99 to go searching for the one, right? How concerned are you about those who have gone astray? How concerned are you about the people around here that don't know the the good shepherd? They're still behind that fence under the care of the bad shepherd. I'm going to ask you something. Don't answer me. It's just something I want to ask you. If you left this building tonight and some guy came up to you and said, "Uh, Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me how to be saved? How do I get to heaven? Can you tell me? If someone asks you, could you tell them right now how to get to heaven? Could you tell them how to get saved? Well, what's that old saying? Uh, what's American Express? Don't leave home without it. See what I carry in my wallet all the time? I don't leave home without it. I'm always prepared to share my faith. Always prepared. So if you don't know of a way to share your faith, then why don't you take one of these tracks? Scott, could you pass them around for me? These are one of the best tracks I have ever found when it comes to sharing your faith. It makes it really clear, really simple. I think mankind has a gift for, for complicating things, something that's real simple. If you would always carry this around with you, you will always be prepared to share your faith. You don't have to be a theologian. Better yet, if you want, come see me and I will give you one of my business cards because on my business card it says truelife.org and it refers people to this website, truelife.org that has high quality videos that answering life's hard questions. Why, why is there suffering? I, no, I don't. I, I do, but they're in my office. How many more do we need? Okay. Uh, come see me right after the sermon and I'll get them for you, okay? Whoever didn't get some. Yeah, do you know where they're at? No. Behind my desk, the bottom, you'll see a box in the bottom right side in a box, okay? But just real quick, um, give, me, give me about three minutes. If you look through here, step one. And this is what, I've, I've used this so many times, it's, it's not funny, and it's a great, 
uh, great tool because it just makes it so simple. And he explained to them, God has a purpose for your life, has uh, a purpose of peace in your life. And it gives some scripture there. And then the next page, it says, well, why don't most people have this peace and abundant life that God planned for us to have? That brings them to step two. The problem is our separation from God. And I, I love the picture here. You can see, look, we're, we're separated from God. We're over here. God's over here. And there's a great chasm between us. And that chasm is called sin. And then you can take him to the next page. Some people try to breach that chasm with good works, religion, philosophy, morality. But as you can see, all these things fall short, don't they? All these things fall short. Step three. We, sh we, see, we show them that the cross of Christ is what bridges the gap between God and man. Jesus' sacrifice on, on the cross, right? God has made the provision. Then step four is our response to receive Christ. Revelation 3.20. Is everyone with me? Are we all on the same page? I usually take them at this point. And I, I, I read this. I say, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. So here God is knocking on the door of their heart. You notice God is a perfect gentleman. He will not force his way into your life. He's knocking. So what do you have to do? But he gives you the freedom. You don't have to open the door, do you? And a lot of people, you know, I've, I've taken people all the way through this. And I say, would you like to pray to receive Christ right now? And no no so what do you do you just pray for another opportunity but the lord doesn't force his way into our lives he knocks okay and then john 1 12 yet to all who received him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of god verse 10 uh, uh verse 9 of romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth jesus is lord and believe in your heart god raised him from the dead you will be saved and then the next page is Here's how you can receive Christ. Number one, admit you're a sinner. And I asked the person, do you admit that you're a sinner? And explain what a sinner is. Someone who rebels against God. What I usually get uh, as I'm talking through the course of this is, uh, I'm a good person. Yeah, I'm a good person. Yeah, so. And they honestly believe that when they get to the end of their lives, God is going to weigh their good deeds and bad deeds on the, on the scale. And they just hope that their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds bad deeds and that's not biblical because one sin the bible says can keep you out of heaven what would happen if god allowed one sin into heaven it would cease to be heaven look what happened when one sin entered into the garden of eden right remember god is holy 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 he can't be in the presence of sin so God has made a provision for our sin problem by sending his son Jesus. And it's by the blood of Jesus Christ that we're made pure and righteous before God. So now when God sees us, he sees Jesus Christ in our hearts and our lives. Then ask him, are you willing to turn from your sins? In other words, you can't just add Jesus to your life and continue on as business as usual. You have to subtract sin and then add Jesus Christ, right? Believe Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and rose from the grave. Then through prayer, invite Jesus into your life. And then I usually have them pray this prayer, but I'm really careful about this because I don't want to create a false convert. I don't want to create someone who says, well, I prayed the prayer. This prayer doesn't save you. Because remember, it says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I think what we have in the church today are a lot of false converts. They say, you know what? I prayed the prayer. Well, you know what? It takes more than praying a prayer. You have to mean it in your heart. Because how are we saved? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right? And that means Jesus is king, master. So that means who's sitting on the throne of your life? He is. He's Lord. He's master. He's Yahweh. He's king. He is Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. See, the problem with us is we're like sheep who have gone astray. We don't want to be under a shepherd's care. I always, uh, when you see these mangy dogs running around the side of the road, I always wonder, man, what type of environment did they leave? Some of them probably left a good environment, but they wanted out of that backyard so bad. But you know what? They're free. 
They're free to get hit by cars. They're free to get mange. They're free to get bugs. They're free to scrounge for their own food. So are they really free? And that's what, when people reject Christ, they say, well, I want to be free. Yeah, you're free to serve Satan because the Bible says you're, you're a slave to what masters you. Sin is your master. So you're going to be a slave to, to sin. So I have them pray that prayer, make sure it's from the heart. And then tell them, if you prayed the prayer, uh, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And it is by grace you have been saved. And then my favorite passage, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. He who has the Son has life. And I ask him, where was God before you prayed? Remember, he was knocking on the door of your heart and life. Did you invite him in? And he says, if you invite him in, what did he say he would do? He would come in. He would come in. So if you invited him in by prayer, you have the Son. So if you have the Son, you have life, right? He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may guess you have eternal life. That you may know. Does God want you to be certain? Does the good shepherd want you to know that you're in his hands? Absolutely. He doesn't want you guessing. He says, you know what? Your salvation is not based on your ability to hold on to me. Your salvation is what I have done for you through my son, Jesus Christ, and my ability to hold on to you. And I want you to know that if you have my son, you have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. We're going to close in prayer. And if you've never received Jesus, then we invite you to come forward during a time of invitation. Or maybe you want to join this church, however the Lord may lead you. Maybe you just want to come up and pray or just pray where you're at. But this is your time to respond to the message here this, this evening. So let, let's have a word of prayer as we prepare for the invitation. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that we serve such an awesome shepherd. And Father, we invite you to be our shepherd. We want to be under your care. We want you to lead us to, to green pastures besides still waters. Father, we, we, we know that you are the good shepherd who takes care of his sheep, and your sheep listen to your voice and hear your voice. Father, forgive us for those times in our lives when we let the world crowd your voice out, and we just don't have time to pray. We just don't have time to, to read your word or to hear from you. But Father, help us to manage our time. We know that if, if we could give you the first fruits of the day, that, that the rest of our day will be right that you will fill the hours and the time of our day and give us wisdom and direction. So, Father, as we leave here today, may we, may we just uh, uh, remember that you love us, that you're on the job 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You know every detail of our, our lives. You're intimately involved in, in our lives, and, and you want to be the good shepherd who, who cares for us. Let us remember that when we, when we feel separated from you, when we feel perhaps like David, when we're, we're on the run, we're being persecuted. David was hiding in a cave, but Dave could, David could cry out, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. So Father, regardless of the circumstances we may face tomorrow, this week, next month, may each of us here be able to say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. We ask that your perfect and pleasing will be done in all things. We love you and we thank you that you are our shepherd. You are the good shepherd who cares for us in our time of need, who, who uh, uh, provides for us, who meets us, Father, when, when we're down and out, who encourages us, who keeps us safe, who protects us from the evil one. So, Father, help us to keep our eyes on you and not on the things of this world not on how much money we have in a bank or our neighbors or, or anything else. Let us keep our eyes upon you, Lord. And may you guide and direct our steps as we walk through the valleys in this life. May you comfort us, strengthen us. And Father, I pray that, that we'll be sheep that always bring a smile to your face. And that when we get to heaven, that we'll hear those beautiful words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. 
Oh, Father, I want to please you. I know we want to please you, Father. I know that those who, who come on Sunday night are, are uh, uh, committed to you, uh, to, to give up their time. They could easily be sitting home watching TV or doing the things of this world, but, Father, they chose time out of their busy schedules to be here tonight to continue to worship you and to praise you and to draw near to you. So I pray that as, as we come here tonight to draw near to you, as your word says, when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So may we just sense you in a powerful way in our lives, the good shepherd, as you wrap your arms around us and comfort us and encourage us and uh, breathe the Holy Spirit into our lives and bless us as only you can, Father Lord, so that we could be a blessing to others. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen.